Let's stand to sing 78, My Hope is in the Lord. wonderful day God has uh, given us. We're excited about all the prospects. We've already been greatly blessed and challenged, and we know that that will continue throughout the day. Take your Bibles with me, please. We're turning to Genesis chapter 22. Uh, you're becoming very familiar with the text. Genesis 22 will read, I think, for the second to the last time, uh, verses 1 through 14. So first book of the Bible, 22nd chapter, first 14 verses. As you find that, I'll invite you to stand with me for the reading of God's holy and precious word. And it came to pass after these things that God did test Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here am I. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and cut the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spoke unto Abraham his father and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. And they came to the place which God had told him of, and Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, 
Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him, for now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah-Jireh, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. Thank you. You may be seated for our time of prayer. Oh God, our hearts are not only thrilled, but moved even with a simple reading of the text. We have noted many times that it's classic, which which means basically that uh, we have been familiar with this story, which is actually a historical narrative. We've been familiar with it for a long, long time, for many of us since we were just little pups. God, you are so gracious to us in sending your son, of course, the one and only Savior. But you're also so gracious in giving to us your word and scripturated. I mean, when we hear truth like this, we would say, God, can we write it down? We would say, and that's exactly what you've done. Been scripturated, inspired, inerrant, infallible word of God to man. And oh, the blessed gospel. And to think that we see it in the shadows here early on in, 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 in the first book the book of beginnings. And oh, how you have been reminding us of how active the pre-incarnate Christ has been since the beginning of human history. And of course, he has been in existence for all of eternity past. And God, that gives us great hope, uh, hope that we have sung of again this morning. Hope, not only as it pertains to salvation from sin, which is the all-important first thing, but hope as it pertains to this life that you've given to us and hope as it pertains to the life to come. We rejoice in you again today, and we've come to worship you and you alone. Pray for those who have not yet trusted Christ that today would be the day of salvation for them. I pray for the rest of us that your truth and the Great Commission would recommission and restir our hearts. Thank you so much for the Fergusons. Oh, how we love and appreciate them and their faithfulness to what uh, has proven to be a difficult ministry. Thank you for their hearts, for you and for the gospel and for the lost. Pray for Brian, Stacy, and for their baby that you would have your special hand of blessing upon them. Pray that you would continue to grant them wisdom from on high as they too um, seek to chart their course with you, God, through this difficult time. But oh, what a great God we have. And oh, what a privilege is ours to worship him today. Help us in that all-important endeavor, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I had a uh, conversation via Zoom. That's a video conferencing thing. So you see a picture of a person, you hear him with a colleague at work. And he was obviously under great stress. He was, he was in constant motion as he spoke with his hands all over his head, his face. He was just obviously, obviously distressed with, with just the, the burdens of work. And I wanted to cry out and say, be still. We can be still as we trust the one who has the future in his hand. We can be still because God is able and God loves us. The psalmist in Psalm 46.10 says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted on the earth. Let's turn our hymnals and watch on the screen to number 77. Be still, my soul. Stand to sing. Be 
still my soul. The Lord is on thy side. Bear patiently the cross of be seated for what comfort we have in our God. And now we have special music from Mr. Luke Richardson. I appreciate his ministry with the uh, call to worship time, praise time each Sunday, and I appreciate his ministry in special music. There's a grace when the heart is under fire Another way when the walls are closing in So when I look at the space between Where I used to be and this reckoning I know I will never be alone There was another in the fire Standing next to me, there was another in the waters, holding back the seas. And should I ever need reminding of how I've been set free, there is a cross that bears the burdens where another died for me. 
There is another in the fire Oh, my dad left for dead beneath the waters. I'm no longer a slave to my sin anymore. And should I fall in the space between what remains of me and this reckoning? Either way, I won't bow to the things of this world. I know I'll never be alone There is another in the fire Standing next to me There is another in the waters Holding back the seas and Should I ever need reminding The power set me free There is a grave that holds nobody now the power lives in me There is another in the fire I can see the light in the darkness As the darkness bows to Him I can hear the roar of the heavens as the space between west and I can feel the ground sit beneath us as the prison walls cave in. Nothing stands between us. Nothing stands between us. There is no other name but the name that is Jesus. He who was and still is and will be through it all. So come what may of the space between all the things unseen and this reckoning. I know I will never be alone. There'll be another in the fire standing next to me. There'll be another in the waters. Holding back the seas and Should I ever need reminding Of how good you've been to me I'll count the joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be There is another in the fire Thank you, Luke. We appreciate that. A song uh, reminded us of Christ's promise, of course, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, but also a reminder of Christ's invitation for us to follow him and even the cost that we incur, it should be gladly um, in, in doing so. Appreciate uh, your ministry. Let's pray together. God, we pause for just a moment, again this morning, as a prelude to our study of the Word of God, recognizing our ongoing dependency upon you and the Spirit of God, in both understanding and then making proper application to our lives, your truth. As we so often identify, these are the words of God, not the words of men and we are dependent upon the Spirit of God, not the Spirit of man. And we're so glad that these are your things, and we are so glad that they have stood the test of time. We are so glad that in a most practical way our confidence concerning your word and your truth grows and deepens. It really is our anchor. It really is our rock. And so what joy it is for us to be able to corporately study the word of God together and, and to learn and to grow together. 
Thank you for this very special text. Continue to turn the light on for us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. We are nearing the end of the biblical narrative regarding Abraham's offering of Isaac. We consider this morning verse 13 of Genesis chapter 22. So take a look, Genesis 22 and verse 13. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns, and Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. Oh, folks, the things that we have seen and heard, all oh, the drama, all oh, the suspense, all oh, the pathos. I'm telling you, God has been strumming the strings of my heart from the get-go. God had instructed Abraham to offer his only begotten and only beloved and only promised son Isaac as a burnt offering, can you imagine? And Abraham, with the deepest faith, has systematically and efficiently gone about doing that, only to be stopped by God at the very last moment, as we saw last week. I remind you again, this proves to be a test, only a test, but Abraham does not discover that until the very end. Verse 13 informs us that Abraham looks. I love all the details. You are quickly captured by that, and I love the movements, even though everything that's before us is, you, you know, presented with simple language. I love the action. I love how we quickly place ourselves there. I love watching and listening with you. Verse 13 informs us that Abraham looks and sees a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. Isn't it interesting, the details that God has given to us here? God wants you to know that. And so again, we process every single detail. And I just, with a view to the ram being caught in a thicket by his horns, I just want to pause for a few moments this morning and recognize with you how appropriate that is. in at least four ways. One, the, the, the ram certainly was an acceptable sacrifice. It's fitting in well. It fits in well with the sacrificial scheme that has already been in place. Remember, we've watched Abraham worship in the past, and we've watched as that worship has involved the sacrifice of animals. How appropriate that this is a ram. You, you know going forward in regard to, um, to the sophisticated details of the sacrificial system under the Mosaic law that there will be five acceptable animals. Sheep, goats, oxen, turtle doves, and pigeons. By the way, for those of you that have been with us in our study in Genesis, you'll be able in your mind's eye to go back with me to Genesis chapter 15 and verse 9 and re-watch what takes place as God officially and formally ratifies the Abrahamic covenant with Abraham. And Abraham, as a part of that covenant, offers five different kinds of animals by way of sacrifice. Guess what? Sheep, goats, oxen, turtle doves, and pigeons. So God has already established stuff. And that is an interesting note. Abraham doesn't look and see a camel. Doesn't look and see a rock badger. Doesn't look and see a wabbit. 
just wanted to make sure you're listening. He sees a ram, an acceptable sacrifice. Second uh, appropriateness, the ram is caught by his horns. I don't know if you've thought that through practically. You guys are so good, so you probably have. But the ram is caught by his horns, and based upon, and you guys are good students of the word, based upon your knowledge of the sacrificial animal, you know that it needs to be without spot and without blemish. Isn't it interesting that God communicates to us that the ram is caught in a bush by his horns? He hasn't fallen off a cliff. His leg isn't captured by a trap. Nor is he wallowing in the mud. But he's caught by his horns. A third appropriateness. I could weep. The ram's horns are caught in a bush, more than likely a thorn bush. Look. And see if he's not wearing a crown of thorns. I know we need to be careful with typology, and I realize that, and, and this is especially true of Pastor Tom because of his passion, I know we need to be very careful with typology. I realize the significant danger of us seeing something there that isn't actually there. But every once in a while we come across in the Word of God with a view to biblical types, we come across a type that we are quick to recognize that we have not yet seen the depth of the typology. And I would venture to say that this is such a type. Oh, the typology. And then speaking of typology, a fourth appropriateness here, and you'll have to stick with me, follow me in regard to this. I, it, it's in two parts. I love the fact that both Abraham and Isaac were looking to God for an acceptable sacrifice. You're accustomed to that. The reason why you're sitting here this morning saved, 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 is because you have looked to God for an acceptable sacrifice, and you know that there's only one. But don't miss the significance of that. This is... This is the wolf and warp of biblical Christianity. Man is required, in case you're interested in having a personal relationship with the one true, living, creating, seeking, and saving God, man is required to look outside of himself. And man, frankly, is required not only to look outside of himself, but to look off and away from any other thing or person. Save for the Lord Jesus Christ. Essential. Man, we almost missed a big chunk of theology there. I love the fact that both Abraham and Isaac were looking to God for an acceptable sacrifice. I'm rehearsing with you. Isaac had asked his dad in verse 7, Dad, where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham in the next verse had responded, God, God, God will provide himself a lamb. By the way, your and my life would improve drastically if that was always our first response to anything that we're facing. God! 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 Again, it brings us back to the essential and fundamental truth that 
man has to look to God. It makes you want to sing, look and live, right? Look and live. But I also love the fact that Abraham and Isaac were looking for a lamb and God gave them a ram. And you say, Pastor Tom, aren't they both sheep? Yep. Again, very acceptable. Acceptable sacrifices, but isn't it interesting the way that this practically pans out? It's as if Abraham and Isaac going forward would still be looking for the lamb. By the way, and we'll see this more fully soon, Once again, we're in the process of discovering that Abraham understands and sees a lot more than we think he does. Remember Christ's words, we'll look closely at it, but you know how I just am constantly jumping the gun. Abraham saw my day, Christ said, and rejoiced in it. What in the world? Abraham saw Christ's day? As you know, the Old Testament animal sacrifices were temporary. They provided a temporary covering. They were essential. It was per God's prompting and instruction. And again, you're very familiar with that. But each and every one of those temporary sacrifices prompted the one who was doing the sacrificing to recognize that he would have to continue to look, to look ahead to the once for all. The never to be repeated. Listen, the eternally effective sacrifice of the Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then that since then, Abraham and Isaac here would still be looking for the Lamb who would pick up and permanently carry off the sins of the world, yours and mine. I was prompted, by the way, to plug all of this in with a view to our beloved missionaries. You're going to have to be as wise as serpents and as harmless or innocent as doves. And yet, when everything is said and done, what they have done and are doing and will continue to do is to prompt people to look to God for an acceptable sacrifice for sin ultimately leading them to the Son of God, who amazingly is the sacrifice. Unbelievable. Blessedly unbelievable. I think one of the neatest phrases in verse 13 is the one we find at the end of the verse. I'm going to read the verse again just to keep you engaged there. 22 and verse 13. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering. Here it is, in the stead of... We have one, two, three, four words in the English, all coming from a single Hebrew word. Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. Of course, a 
phrase is a lot more than just neat. This is the wondrous doctrine of substitution. I'll tell you this, that if you ever fully see it, it will make you run to the one who took your place. We started reveling in it last week, prompted by the previous verse, but here it is again, the blessed and wondrous doctrine of substitution that Christ took our place. He bore our penalty. He paid our debt. And you're familiar with the prophet Isaiah's blessed words in 53 of his Book, surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken and smitten of God, but he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, and the chastisement for our peace was upon him. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. By the way, many of you are familiar with uh, Harry A. Ironside. And I, I, have, I have a quick reading for you. He focuses in on verse 6, which is a verse that begins and ends with that tiny little significant English word, all. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us. What class? All. Listen to this. I have it taped on the inside of my Bible in case you just wonder. By the way, you, you might want to, I don't leave my Bible anywhere, but if by chance I left my Bible, boy, that would be entertaining for you to thumb through it. <laughs> I'm not sure yay or nay, good or bad, but wow, that would be entertaining. So he cites Isaiah 53, 6, and listen to his words here, a, a short uh, paragraph. Here we have the entire story of the Bible epitomized. Man's ruin, both by nature and practice, and God's marvelous and all-sufficient remedy. The verse begins with all and ends with all. An anxious soul was directed to this passage and found peace. Afterward, he said, I bent low down and went in at the first all. I stood up straight and came out at the last. The first is the acknowledgement of our deep need. The second shows how fully that need has been met in the cross of Christ. Happy to be numbered among those who have put their claim, put in their claim and found salvation through the substitutionary atoning work which took place on Calvary's cross. Listen, somebody, I mean somebody, died for you in your place. We're safe in saying that's the most wonderful thing in the whole wide world. Christ actually taking our place on Calvary's cross. And, and yet I'm afraid that we sometimes have trouble seeing and embracing the realness of it all. But the Hebrew word helps us with that. The Hebrew word that we have here in verse 13, the Hebrew word that stands behind our English phrase in the stead of, it helps us to grasp the truth. Takath is the Hebrew word. And you'll be interested in another place where we find it. 
This word is repeated over and over and over again in the familiar biblical phraseology, and I'm about to give it to you, but need to say in the same breath that even the worldling is familiar with it. Did you get all that? The word is used repeatedly in the familiar biblical phraseology, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burning for burning, wound for wound, stripe for stripe, life for life. If you've ever been wondering about biblical warrant for actually embracing what we often cite, and that is that the Lord Jesus Christ took my place on Calvary's cross and bore the penalty for every single sin. It is here. An eye for an eye. And a life for a life. You have to see that every single one of your sins was picked up, carried, and cared for by him. And again, I would propose that when you do, you will not only run to him for salvation, of necessity he is the one and only Savior. But then you'll keep running to him for strength. to live the reciprocated sacrificial life. You'll run to him for salvation and then you'll keep running to him for strength to do any and all that he has commanded, called, commissioned. One other golden nugget from the Hebrew word. Because really we've only talked about half of the story in regard to the great substitutionary sacrifice of Christ on Calvary's cross where he has absolutely borne the penalty of our sins so that we wouldn't have to but he's not done just with that. He doesn't just care for the bad. He showers the good. He doesn't just rescue. He absolutely blesses and glorifies and satisfies ultimately making you and this happens instantly by the way a permanent part of his family you know where else we find this Hebrew word in Isaiah 61 and verse 3, where he gives beauty for ashes and joy for mourning. See, not only takes care of the mourning, he gives you the joy. He not only takes care of the ashes, he makes you beautiful. Talk about going the extra mile. That's exactly what Christ does. He doesn't just offer forgiveness. He justifies you. 
Sticking with Isaiah, you know it's one of my favorite verses. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with his robe of righteousness. Not just forgiven, but declared righteous in Christ. Makes you want to be in. Makes you want to be. you're in. And if you need my help in regard to that, I'd be absolutely thrilled. Have a few missionaries around that would be thrilled to sit down with you as well. Let's pray together. God, we thank you so much for these considerations. Oh God, we continue to stand in awe of you and your word. We stand in awe of the truth. We have biblical warrant for seeing the typology here, and again, absolutely amazing. That we can and actually must see Christ here in Genesis 22, more to come in regard to that, and yet we have certainly seen and heard enough to go running to the one and only Savior. And so I'm careful to pray for those who may be here today or within the sound of this voice who have not yet trusted Christ. Oh, that today, oh, that now would be the time that they run and embrace the one and only Savior from sin. And then, God, what about us who are saved, some of us, for many, many, many years? Oh, that we'd continue to run to you for strength. Oh, that we'd continue to run to you to get our marching orders. Oh, that we would continue to run to you having our hearts and ears tuned to your commands, your calls, and your commissions. Oh, to be faithful. to this one who loved us and gave himself for us. God, continue to stir our hearts and drive these truths deep. Therein we pray in Jesus' name, amen. We praise God for the sacrifice of Jesus Christ in our stead, in our place. Let's turn to hymn number 284, O Sacred Head, Now Wounded. 284, we'll sing the first verse in closing. Please stand to sing. Sacred head now wounded with grief and shame weighed down, house worn fully surrounded with thorns thine only crown. How art thou pale with anguish? With Willett, would you close our time in prayer, please? Lord, we thank you for this day, your day, and that we can be in this service this morning, and especially for this message, which you went the extra mile. We just thank you for it. In a few days, Lord, our school will open for another year. I would ask that you would be bless our teachers and our students, Lord. Now we would ask that you would be with us for the afternoon, bring us back safely so we can hear our missionaries tonight, Lord. In your name we pray, amen.